And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers to the temple, cre creators of the double-headed monster known as Radio Free Covenant. In the blue corner, we have Sean Daly, not hourly, not weekly, not even monthly, Sean Daly. And in the and in the red corner, we have the we have the sassy one, Mr. Sazzy Ronti. How are we doing today, man? Doing Excellent. all right. Yes. Just so uh, just so you know, I'm Sean, and uh, the other person that was speaking is Sazzy. Oh yeah, and me. Okay, okay, I got I got to get this out of my system now. Which one to use the Abbot and which one to use the Costello? Uh, I would say uh I'm I'm, pro I'm probably uh, I'm probably the bad bad. No, I'm I'm Abbot. <laughs> Says he's definitely Costello. <laughs> <laughs> if only because I'm the taller one. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. like I have to look up at almost everyone. Every 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 male at least I have to look up. I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> um, Sean, how tall are you? Uh, about five eleven six six ish. Excuse me. You're st both of you are still shorter than me. Mm. Oh dear. I'm six six. Wow. <laughs> oh, holy, damn. Yeah. So I. Yeah. And, I and, and shoulders. Mm -hmm. I end up yeah, looking God. down on a, on most people. Yeah. Um. Like... Because and because of that, I'll get <clears throat> I'll get somebody come I'll get somebody coming up to my desk and saying, "Hey, can you grab something off the top shelf for me?" And then I say, mm -hmm. "Yes," and then I get back to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. You can probably is... you can probably figure out where they went where they went wrong. Yeah. Uh, it is the code of the giants. Well, for what it, for what it's worth, I make I make fun of short people and I make fun of my own height because being tall has its disadvantages, least of which <laughs> being getting clothes and yeah. also airlines. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh, oh god, Co coach, when you're six six, I don't even want to consider that. Oh jeez. <laughs> yeah. The jeez. Oh, especially <laughs> since they want to charge extra to get the emergency exit seat. Yeah. So I try. I try to avoid. If I could get a, if I could get around through nothing but through nothing but Greyhound or or Amtrak or something, that would that would have been ideal. But that's not yeah. the case. Yeah. Oh boy. Because um, no way I'm getting my own jet. No way am I getting my own jet. But <laughs> I like to. <laughs> I'd like to start out at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Okay. Um, as I as I often do, it as is tradition here. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, respectively, and what was it that made it stick? Um, well, I'll start, I guess. Um, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm 50 years old, and I started with uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. I uh, got started with it, you know, playing Saturdays, you know, at, you know, the library, or at the local junior high school, playing with a bunch of other kids. It really, it really didn't stick then, though. I had AD and D. I had Star Frontiers. I was ma mainly uh, TSR. I played a little uh, Werewolf in college, but really didn't stick then. But then I came. But then I moved from New Jersey to Las Vegas, and uh, one of my friends said, "Hey, we uh, have a." One of my coworkers said, "Hey, we have a uh, we have a role playing group, and you know, since I've played before in the past, uh, I said, okay, I'll I'll join you. I I need to I need to get to know people in Las Vegas, and I have not looked back since then because my D the the DM that I have played with for some twenty one years since then is uh, an excellent D is an excellent DM. He's you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not so much, it's the dice chucking for me, 
but it's also the fact that it's also the it's it's also the social aspect of it and it's also the the, the role playing aspect sometimes i just find a character that i like and uh, it just clicks with me and stepping into that character's t- into that character's shoes is just very satisfying so it's it's a combination of things i think mm-hmm. uh i guess it's your turn sassy well it depends if we're starting with uh, tabletop or online stuff. If we're going tabletop, it would be, well, in high school, I had a friend who um, he uh, was running a D&D campaign, and a bunch of the characters were just wiped in it, and um, he looks over to me, he's like, you ever played D&D before? I'm like, no. What's that? Because I was very sheltered at the time, and I'm like... <laughs> Uh, let me put it this way Irish Catholic and Jewish Russian household so very sheltered yeah but yes I was like what's this and he showed me and I'm like wow oh boy this could be interesting and I will admit it right now my first character was you know how like teenagers and like the edgy stuff and mine was yeah. the half dragon half werewolf like in mm-hmm. tabaxi nonsense and i'm yeah. just like yeah oh, i'm 37 right now but no it wasn't a tabaxi it was a dwarf it was a dwarf and yeah. dwarven half dragon like dwarf yeah. and i'm 37 now and this was in like 2001 2002 when this is happening and mm. I end up with a character who he, the, my friend didn't want in us having like things like uh, breath weapons where we could control it because of how powerful that could be. Sorry. Um, um, cause of how powerful that could be. So, uh, what he did was like, it's like, all right, so you can have this sort of, but it's not going to be under direct control and it will be very strong, but, it won't always happen when you want it to happen or it may happen when you don't want it to happen. I think and... I know where this story is going. <laughs> I think you told me this one. Oh, yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. Well, one day, our characters are being chased overnight by a band of orc bandits. That came out strangely. Band of orc bandits. But anyway, we're being chased up into the hills, into the into the, into the mountains. And there's a cliff I, to our right and the rock face to our left. Well, there's a dire bear at the end of, the, of one of the blind turns around the mountain. It's blocking the path. Behind is the orcs, army group that's coming up the hill, the, mm. the mountain, the road behind us. In front is the dire bear. DM says, roll d20 to me. I roll on. I get a 20. He's like, okay, roll another. Do it again. Same result. <laughs> do another one. Do another one, he then says. <laughs> in that tone of voice, do another one. So I get a third 20. He then goes, okay, well, I'm going to roll one just to make sure up here. He rolls a, He If he, someone was getting a lot of good luck, he would uh, do a... Uh, roll as well just to kind of confirm this mm-hmm. just to kind of make sure we weren't like fucking around with the dice or using weighted dice or something. he'd do it one anyway a fourth 20 so he rolls a bunch wow. of dice to the side and then he's he goes and he um he looks toward the the, the map and the uh the table in his place and he suddenly starts removing all of the orcs off of the road, which is literally all of them. He starts removing all of them from that. I'm wondering what's going on. Everyone else is wondering what's going on. And then he takes the bear, and he takes it off the thing. He takes my player indicator, puts him at the end where the cliff, where that blind turn is, the cliff, but not over the side. It seems to run some kind of calculation in his head for a minute, and then puts them about like a grid space back further back still on the road but you know back to- closer toward the group and he's like well your character just took off like a saturn 5 rocket 
incinerated the entire orc army behind them and knocked the dire bear off a cliff when they farted. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and by the way, you're going to need to buy new pants when you get to a town because you basically burned them off as well as all of the armor around that region. So you have... You've lost your uh, supply pack because a cotton fire had burned off. You've lost half your cuirass and the entire ass of your pants. So, yeah. Yeah, you just told me about the death part. You didn't tell me about all the setup for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This, and then... um. As uh, for the uh, why I stuck with this kind of stuff, it would be uh, partially the social aspect and partially the uh, getting into character thing, like what Sean said. Mm -hmm. I will admit, though, I find it a little easier to work with um, things that don't involve um, so much extensive dice rolling, which is one of the reasons why uh, Covenant really drew my attention because of the way it works. Uh, most of my RPG experience has been um, with things like, oh, okay, so the Fantasy Star series on the Sega Master System and then Genesis, things like that. It's mm -hmm. been like um, there. Final Fantasy as well, but Fantasy Star was always the bigger influence, which is why uh, sci fi RPGs really grabbed my attention, especially since there's a few of them. Mm -hmm. Every, everyone wants the fantasy medieval stuff, and meanwhile, I'm like, give me those lasers. People. Yeah. I want the lasers, and and uh, there was a little game for the Sega Dreamcast called Fancy Star Online. Oh yes. And my first roleplay experience was actually there. The D and D incident was after, because uh, PSO one released on the Dreamcast, and I had a keyboard and everything. And I'm I'm typing with friends, and some people are like in in character in one of the lobbies and. And I had no idea what was going on initially. And so I was like, I kind of popped in just for the hell of it on, like that. And they thought I was RPing with them. And then I actually started. And then that the little group of us um, carried over to uh, Fantasy Star Universe. And we kept doing that over there. And then, um, and then uh, it, I got lured into Champions Online. And that's where I met Sean. And yeah. And this was like I and it, like you said, this was Champions Online back in uh, you know the Obama administration. So yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that bring, that brings me to um, to cup to Radio Free Covenant. Mm -hmm. um, now you guys have you guys have done something that is that even in even in the indie spaces is fairly uncommon. In that you're doing a a um a diceless game, mm -hmm. and that's not to say diceless games are an extreme rarity, but in the grand scheme in the grand scheme of things, um, it's lar it's large the the last ma the last major diceless game that I that I delved into mm -hmm. was um, Lords of Gossamer and Shadow, which was basically a spiritual successor to Amber. Yeah, and for a lot of people, when they think diceless games, they're going to be thinking of Amber. Yeah, um, I did delve into Marvel Universe, which is the redheaded stepchild of of uh, Marvel's Marvel's flirtations with tabletop gaming. Mm -hmm. Um, but for but um, did you ha did either of you have experience prior to this with diceless play, or is that not the case? Uh, can I answer this, uh, Sazzy? Yeah, that's fine. You're the uh, okay. one behind the mechanics here. Okay, yeah. I um, I have no experience with dice to play. All of my, all of the games that I played, uh, all the uh, role-playing games that I played were dice, were dice games. But uh, I, while I was, and originally Covenant was a dice game, uh, and uh, the 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 uh, core mechan the, the mechanic that we're using now uh, the uh, resource mechanic that we're using for for Covenant now uh, 
just a correction the, the game is not uh radio free, is not radio free covenant it's mm -hmm. just covenant radio free covenant is the name of the is the name of the company i'm sorry okay um but uh covenant was just going to be uh two it's just we're just going to have two dice because everyone because everyone can scrounge up two dice in their house whether they you know cannibalize it from a monopoly set or someone oh, yeah. everyone has at least two dice in their house two six-sided dice and the discipline was just going to be a new uh we're just going which is going to be a brownie points or hero points but uh the hero points started to the uh discipline points started to take on more and more of a role and finally uh you were they were you were able to uh you know spend one discipline point to increase your check by one and i just thought you know this game really doesn't need the dice it doesn't really need dice it just needs discipline so it, it was just kind of a natural progression and also i was doing research into tabletop role playing games around that time uh, about i'm gonna say about five years ago yeah and i was i learned about you know how you know i learned more about how dungeons and dragons the first role-playing game you know evolved out of uh evolved out of uh war games which used a lot of dice mm -hmm. and i started you know learning about you know games that didn't use dice or used alternatives there were even uh there were even role-playing games that used jenga sets uh oh, yes. you know yeah, yeah and uh and i i had no idea about this and i thought this was just completely crazy this is completely crazy and and uh as it as time went on it's like no this actually isn't crazy this is act this actually fits the game and so that's why it's a diceless game. I have, I have no experience playing the damn things, but it just, but being diceless just fit Covenant. And that's it. Oh, yeah. And I, I remember when you asked me about that, my opinion on the matter, and I'm like, yes! Yeah. Because I had, um, I'm going to put it this way, not to interrupt Sean here, but I had uh, been during that time doing a lot of, like, RP on like uh, Second Life and the big thing at the time for role playing Sims there were uh, okay. So quick thing for or those unfamiliar, uh, Second Life uh, is kind of everything's user created content. There's no mm -hmm. game mechanics specifically unless people make them. Mm -hmm. Well, up until that up up, up until uh, that point. A lot of uh, conflict resolution was done real time mechanics. You would go around and, like, say, there was a Final Fantasy VII RP sim in, that took place in Midgar, and they had a uh, combat simulation system where you would literally run around like it was a first person shooter if you had, like, a gun and you were actually, you, like, shooting like it was a shooter game. And then uh, yeah. if you were using a melee weapon, you were in third person, but you would try to chase people around and smack them with a weapon and try to avoid being hit, things like that. Well, that mechanic started to fall by the wayside because uh, SL being run on such a wide variety of systems and the uh, issues of being such a processor-heavy game and a networking-heavy yeah. game, you need a very good connection. for To be able to be successful in that kind of combat, you have to have a very good connection. You have to have a very, very good PC. Otherwise... I mean, we're talking ridiculously good PC, so it kind of excludes everyone except the, the super rich. Yeah. Well, Sims started migrating toward a uh, turn-based dice-style mechanic system, and basically everyone who um, has any kind of combat system uses dice-based now. Yeah. But around that time was around the time they were starting to introduce it everywhere, and I'm not too much a fan of RNG myself, uh, one of the reasons why I uh, liked um, PSU in particular compared to PSO1 is because PSO1 uses dice rolls in the back system just to determine if your shots hit the target. It's like Morrowind. When you strike an enemy, it does the attack doesn't always connect. Sometimes you'll miss, or you'll you'll do deal very little damage or more damage. Whereas uh, PSU is a little more along the getting closer to um. It was still Morrowind like, but it was getting closer to uh, Oblivion in that as long as the attack connected, you were more likely to get the hit in. Yeah. Um, 
thanks it's a side thing just to close that uh little neurotic habit of mind you have to continue to ramble bso2 mm -hmm. uh, is purely skyrim like you hit the target you hit the target anyway um Basically, everyone was using dice mechanics, and part of my issue with RNG is that I have very bad luck when it comes to RNG. I never it never works out. I've I I uh, I do it from a casual approach. I do it from a serious approach, and the only time I ever had that luck was was that case of the four D twenties all rolling twenty, yes. the, the that rocket launch of the of the half dragon like and dwarf who blasted mm -hmm. a dire bear and an orc army all in one move. Uh, that was the only time I ever had luck with dice. So yeah. any, anyway, um, it's partially kind of more, it's less that I don't like them and more of a preference of if I can avoid using it, I will because mm -hmm. I have such bad luck with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, um, okay. okay. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. Okay. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, well, uh, I just, uh, I just wanted to uh, continue on that very briefly. Uh, mm -hmm. I have seen I, I also have bad luck with it, and I have seen people throw their dice across the room in anger because they kept getting crappy rolls, and I just wanted to avoid that. And uh, another reason we went with dice, another reason I went with diceless is because uh, this is before I met you, Sazzy, but a friend of mine, uh, I had a, uh, I had a, a, a an episode with a, a friend of mine, and. Uh, they, I, I really can't go into details about it, but it gave me a very, uh, gave me a very uh, important, gave me a very visceral sense of the importance of, you know, a person's support networks, the things that support them. And when I was designing, putting, putting together my thoughts, my initial thoughts for this game, I wanted to, I wanted to put in that idea of the importance of a, of your your character's support network and you have to defend that network you have to maintain that network and if you lose that network it's going to go very badly for your characters probably because other characters might you know losing that support network losing the ideals and the uh, people that support your character will be as deadly or more than getting shot at mm -hmm. it can destroy you if you lose that yeah and with the game not being as heavily emphasized on combat alone, um, this is I mean, this is not a war game. Wars ha can happen in the setting, but we're not intending this to be you go to this place and you kill this army of orcs or something, or you fight these people for, for money or something. Yeah. That can happen, but we wanted other aspects of the storytelling to play out as well and um the system that is set is set up for that allows for um other focuses to yeah. have as much impact on the storytelling as the combat rules yeah you do it's the, i i keep saying the, the, I, i'm not a pacifist and sometimes you have to fight but mm -hmm. in uh no, there's nothing, and there's nothing wrong with Dungeons and Dragons. I key, I play it to this day. Uh, that was the first game I like, started with, but the mechanics in it are mostly geared towards conflict, conflict resolution through combat, and and there have been times when I have wanted to do conflict resolution through diplomacy or sneaking around the, the enemy or. Doing, or bribing them or doing something else i just wasn't there were no mechanics for that you either had to homebrew them in or just fight it out anyway and that's another thing i wanted to do with covenant i got i can certainly get that um yeah. now given that given that science fiction was mentioned and there's been the <clears throat> name dropping of fantasy, of the fantasy star series <laughs> Um, science fiction as a whole is a series of questions <laughs> in my mind especially since oh, and this can, this can apply with a lot of genres but not all not all not all SF is, cre is created equally mm -hmm. so 
one of the things I'm curious about is what sort of SF are we de are we dealing with with this? Um, are we dealing with full on space opera? Are we dealing with something a little bit more lo a little bit more low key, a little bit more pulpy? Are we dealing with are we dealing with something that's on the harder end of the spectrum? Where where does Covenant fit in the in this particular uh, paradigm? Well, I would. Uh, I'm a Trekkie, and uh, I I basically look at science fiction in the sense of you know how much like Star Trek is this? Covenant is sort of like Star Trek, but we're trying to make it. But uh, Star Trek can get a little hand wavy at a time and, and covenant too is is also hand wavy i'm gonna admit that but we're trying to be a little bit harder to have the science be a little be just just a little bit harder than it is with uh with star trek uh again nothing wrong with star trek it's you know it's but we're just trying to be a little bit harder than that it's my it's my uh you know entry it, it's my it's something that i just want to do yeah but uh you know the they're for one thing, uh, you know, there are no phasers. There are stun weapons, but there are no, you know, magical phaser or disruptor weapons. For another thing, ships can't go above, uh, are not super luminal. They can't go above uh, the speed of light. They can get real damn close to it. But if you want to go between planets, you're going to have to pump a lot of energy into creating a stargate or a portal that would, that you can fit your uh ship through and there are ships that uh carry uh portal generation uh uh machines those are called key ships mm -hmm. but they are very large because of the portal generation machinery in them and they are also very expensive and very rare most people most ships are going to be su uh subluminal they're going to be uh, below speed uh light speed <laughs> And uh, another thing is, uh, unlike Star Trek, not all of the species in the game, not all of the playable species, I have to say, are you know DNA based. You know, it even goes farther than Mass Effect. Some of the uh, the you know the food that they have is not compatible. If you eat the food that another that another sapient species eats, you're going, it's either going to pass completely untouched through your system or more likely it's going to poison you. Mm -hmm. And the same with their medicine. Uh, everyone is, uh, everyone uh, uses, drinks water and uses and breathes oxygen because it turns out that it's, those are fairly common in the universe and those uh, are, uh, it turns out very, uh, very good. Oxygen is very good for life and water is a very good solvent for life as well but you know other than that everything else that has to do with a uh a uh any and sa other sapient species uh we're trying to go so far as psychology perception that kind of thing mm -hmm. is going to be different it's it's we're trying uh it's it's going like i said it's going to be it's going to be star trek but we're, we're trying to make it a little more grounded, I guess. I guess. And, and because and because of that grounding, I'm get, I'm guessing that um, that kind of that kind of U Federation utopia isn't really going to be as much of a thing. Not really. I mean, the like we said, like I said, the the, the good guys in this are the Covenant. Mm -hmm. They are named after the Halos Covenant, but they are not them. Uh, it is, uh, it's. I'm kind of. Uh, I, I'm kind of. Uh, I'm. A, I'm a very uh, have very left leftist politics. Uh, I'm very. I'm not an anarchist, but I'm very anarchy. Uh, um, very anarchy uh, curious, I guess, and. Uh, the Covenant, at least, is a bunch of independent commonwealths that have a very that have uh, that have some very deep and uh, uh, have some very deep and uh, complicated uh, mutual aid links. But there's no United Federation of Planets. There's no Starfleet. You know, at most, there's uh, 
defend, there's defensive soldiers for one commonwealth, which is the size of a town that, uh, that, uh, will aid, you know, a neighboring, uh, commonwealth, or maybe someone who's trying to, uh, or maybe someone who's trying to join the covenant, you know, from one of the many enemies that the covenant has, you know, there's no, uh, there's no uh, matter replication machines. There's no start. There's no warp drive. Uh, it's it's we're trying not to be utopian. It's just better than what we have right now, is what I'd say. That yeah, part of <clears throat> sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Part of the uh, matter here is that Stark tends to have this idealistic concept that the Federation is the perfect society and meanwhile the people who seem to be in charge of it are quite frankly one of the most flawed things that currently exists societally <laughs> and I can see what they were doing with that um, Gene Roddenberry's idea was to say that humanity had exceeded their cultural limitations and societal limitations and become better yeah, but something in a way was also lost in that when that when that happened, and my problem is that it seems too perfect. And D Space Nine deconstructs this rather extensively, but uh, the Star Treks that come before it, and uh, until Discovery, the Star Treks that come after it, it aside from Star Trek Insurrection, all seem to um go with the idea that the Federation is the perfect thing and can't do any wrong, it feels like sometimes. And it's just like, that's not how this kind of stuff really works. You're going to have situations where where uh, a good intention has a bad result because of unforeseen consequences. Or you may get someone in position of power who everyone... Put them who put them there thought okay they're they're here to do good but then this person uses their power to do bad so um that's another thing that uh, that this um is separated by the the approach is more realistic about how people are uh there are some good people some bad people some who a lot of people who are in the in the middle and could go either way depending on the situation yeah and that's how basically everyone is um any one of us could have a bad enough day and uh could end up doing something awful if pushed too hard you know any one yeah. of us could have a bad day if pushed too hard and if pushed too hard then cause someone else to have a bad day and then there's consequences to that and run a lot and this is more like a setup where with the covenant it's like they seem to understand that and the structure seems to be set up more to facilitate supporting everyone kind of thing. Yeah. It's, 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 um, the, the covenant, uh, if, if I could get into a little deep lore here, but the covenant, uh, covenant kind of see themselves. The covenant doesn't really have a, uh, doesn't really, isn't, isn't like a, a, U, a United States constitution. It doesn't have a governmental system. All it says is that, you know, you do these things, and these are probably the these are probably the best way for sapient beings to to deal with each other. You know, you uh, it's a list of rights and responsibilities that everyone has. But they also say that you know, you know, may you know these uh, these rules were you know the uh, this covenant was made uh, was was uh, laid down you know on a planet you know. 120,000 years ago, the covenant is that law is that old. And it was on a planet that didn't have, and it was made on a planet that didn't have any uh, space flight at the time and didn't even know that there were other sapients in the universe. And, you know, maybe, you know, there's something, maybe there's something beyond that. The covenant, they would say, is the place, they, they would say that the covenant is the placeholder for something better that 
that might come up. You know, there's there's no there's no real exceptionalism to it, and I think it's that that there's that they consider themselves to be not exceptional. That you know, there's not if they make a mistake, you know, you know, the gods or uh, you know, the uh, a universal uh, force in the universe is going to make it all right for them. You know, in the end, by you know, do it, Deus Ex Machina. I think that's what had that's what uh, kept them, you know, uh, around for so long because you know they're they're operating without a tightrope and they under that, and so they're taking needed precautions against falling off the tightrope. And then they also Make sense. Go ahead. And then they they also understand that because of the fact that this that these rules were written quite a long time ago and uh, they're they're being applied in regions that and with cultures that never developed in the same conditions that it needs to be adapted as it comes and so it, it what's uh, probably caused it to remain around so long is the fact that it is flexible and is adaptable and so yeah. that's part of their strength of the adaptability yeah, this is uh, th this is the reason it's taking so long to make this. Is we're trying to we're trying to make the historical uh, underpinnings of it, you know, make sense and work. But we're also kind of trying to make the the political and the philosophical underpinnings of it, you know, make sense. And it we're I don't know if people are going to be interested, you know, in taking in that all that political stuff. But it's stuff that interests me, and I think it's stuff that interests Sazzy too. It is. And yeah. there's also the fact that when you factor these things in and you put the stuff together, people may never touch it directly, but it has an influence and adds a depth to the, to the world setting. That um, if, say, the DM, or the FM in this case, needs this information, they have it available. If the players need yeah. it, they have it available. Uh, but if not, it's still having an, our work on this part of this is still having an effect on the overall game because of the fact that these kind of underpinnings are the building blocks for these societies and they determine how the different groups are and would behave in the given situations and provide something kind of, kind of like a guidepost of sorts mm -hmm. uh, for a future um, expansion into the, into the into the world setting. Which that makes that certainly makes sense. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, Covenant is use is using a resource based um, approach to management. Yes. Um, now, often oftentimes, whenever so, whenever some sort of resource is introduced into um, into tabletop gaming specifically and ga and to a certain extent of gaming in general, there is a tendency to be very conservative with that resource. Mm -hmm. um, the whole, the whole holding off, holding off on that one potion until the end of time, or the I can't use one of my I can't use one of my ninety nine mega elixirs. What if I what if I need it for later? Yeah, but basically, basically, uh, you know, the uh, Skyrim character, you know, who's you know uh, has to has to. Uh, store all of this stuff, you know, in the super storage because he's got 50,000 uh, potions that he never touches. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Like, 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 like that, that one mod, and I'm like, I keep opening up the super storage, and it's like the bag of holding, and I'm like mm -hmm. shoving like millions of potions in it, and like literally yeah. everything I grab in a dungeon, and I walk out, yeah. and I never remember to sell any of them off, and then yeah. bogging down the save file because <laughs> of how large one storage file has gotten mm -hmm. in the game yeah. code. Let's not but, forget I mean, that. But let's not forget that it's, that you're still dealing with a Bethesda game. So yes, it's true. So mm -hmm. the coding is held together with stuck tape and prayer. Yeah. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> yeah, they, programmers go in, go in every day, you know, and, uh, you know, say a prayer to Akatosh before they start the day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sorry. So, my que my question is, how do you, um, 
How do you guys deal with that with that um, tendency for de for defensive? Uh, defensive instead of like more active or offensive play, correct? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, to answer that, uh, for, for uh, me personally, uh, that question is uh, I really uh, I, I really don't know. We're trying to. Uh, that's actually a good question. And I really, I do really don't know how to answer that, but we are play testing it right now. Uh, Sazzy, you have anything you want to add to that? Well, one of the factors is that with the way discipline, which is the resource, yeah, plays out, it's not a um, disposable resource. It's regainable. You yeah, can that, get that, it back. It, it's not that's lost. true. That's true. Yeah, you can uh, if you spend uh if you spend a resource uh you know just to make a bid we don't call them checks we call them bids mm -hmm. but if you call it spend them to make a bid you know you will regain all of that at the end uh of the scene and the same thing goes with attacks from a stun weapon or from unarmed damage you know or something like that there is also chapter damage which you get at the end of the chapter which is you know a you know a series of linked uh scenes and that's more that's more dangerous. Uh, that's more uh, that's more serious and long term damage. But you get all of that back uh, again automatically at the end of the chapter. You don't have to do anything. And uh, we have you, third of all, you have long term damage. Uh, you have long term damage that uh, is trauma, things like that. And. Uh, you don't get those back without going on like a special quest or getting cybernetics or something like that. Now you also have, uh, you also have um, resources called traits, and these give you something called advantages to your bids. If you have more advantages than disadvantages, okay, advantages is something that helps your bid. Advantages is something that doesn't that hinders your bid. Very simple. Doesn't matter how big the how big the effect is. It gives you one advantage, just just to simplify things. Also, just to fix uh, a slight uh, hiccuping, yeah. uh, because I heard your mic cut out for a second. Yeah. And it sounded like you said advantages twice. The second time was disadvantages. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Fill that gap in for anyone who may be yeah, missing that. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, so you have advantages and disadvantages. You have traits. They give you one. They give you each each time you tap one, you get one advantage to a to the bid that you're using and it has to be that trait has to be somehow uh has to somehow be uh related to that bid the, the example that i use is uh a rifle's trait you can use that to shoot a rifle but you can also use that to fix a rifle you can use that to defend from a rifle attack you can use it to buy a rifle you can even use it to talk shop with people who use rifles like soldiers or hunters or, st or people like that traits have a lot of different uses that have a lot of different uses and these traits they uh you they are recharged you can use them again at the end of your turn uh, in a scene mm -hmm. so these you're right it does lend itself to conservative play but you're getting them you are getting your resources back at a regular rate, which will hopefully make the game a little more active. That brings me to the opposite end of the, yes. of the spectrum. Um, are you familiar with going Nova in terms of tabletop design? Uh, no, I am not. This is this is new one. <laughs> um, Sorry. Going no going Nova or Nova Ing mm. in. In the context of role-playing games, is when is when somebody is when somebody tries to dump all of their abilities in one in one go. Um, yeah. Not it's not too far removed from say from say the Alpha Strike um, set setup in BattleTech, where it's just fire mm -hmm. all the guns, heat be damned. Um, yeah. <laughs> um. Now, given given the fact that you're go given the What's um? What would be so? What would be stopping someone from dump from dumping um all all of a given resource on a bid? Well, uh, the the thing stopping them is that well, I'm I'm going to answer that in two ways. 
number one, all of your, uh, the main resource that you have is, uh, resources is, is your traits and your discipline. Now traits, you can only use certain bids, certain traits, you can only cap certain traits for certain bids and, uh, and uh, discipline is also serves as your hit points. It serves as your sanity points. So if you dump everything into a bid, into a single bid, you are going. You have you have basically exhausted your character for the rest of the scene. They won't be able to do anything now. If it call now, on the other end, the other way I, I'm going to answer that is. If you feel like you have to, if you feel like you have to spend all of your resources on something really important, I don't see why you shouldn't be able to. I, I don't see why you shouldn't uh, do that if you want, but you have to understand the consequences of it. You're not just burning all of your ammunition and all of your money and all of that. You're also burning your character's health you're care burning your character's sanity you're bur burning your character's mental endurance you are basically burning your character out at least for the end of the scene and if you want to do that that's fine if all of the uh, pcs want to do that then you better hope that uh, you have more pcs than uh, enemies because otherwise they're just going to be uh they're going to be uh, easy pickings for the enemies that are left. Now, I but know that, you... I know you... Is, go, oh. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I am going to say that that's a very good... I am going to say it's a very good point, and that is something that we have to address, though, but for right now, that's my answer to it. All and right. we are going to have to address that, though. <clears throat> yeah. Um, now... Before before we before we went live, you had mentioned that the multicolored um, setup that that is on on your on your guys's logo um, mm -hmm. is the designation for di for a different species. If it's not too much yeah. of a spoiler, I'd like to I'd like to go through I'd like to go through those colors and what species would be what species would be equivalent and is this and whether or not this is a what kind of um, what kind of rank? What kind of designation these this um, system is me is meant to be used for? Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, any uh, first of all, red. Any species that come from Earth are red. Mm -hmm. uh, like that Earth. would include that would include humans, but there are also artificial uh, creatures called ACOs, artificially created uh, organisms. It's an acronym. And they're like little toy-like uh, animals. They're like little uh, toy-like uh, creatures about about the size of... They come up to about my knee. And uh, they are based on a story by uh, Richard Chedwick, I believe, called The Measure of All Things. And it's also based on uh, Miss Frisbee and the uh, Rats of Nim. But there are also, in addition... Uh, uh, the Corruptum, which are basically vampire bats that come from an alternate timeline. They came here. I They came from a previous game that I was working on, and I didn't want to waste them. So initially I was going to bring them in through this, through that, uh, through the uh, comic book that I had mentioned in the uh, pre-interview uh, into this universe, and then I decided to bring them in to the game. So, uh, humans, echoes, and Corruptum are red. Yellow are the Kalair. The Kalair are basically, uh, they look like lizard people, but they're actually warm blood. They're actually closer to uh, humans. Um, they have very, they have uh, wings. They, I guess that you could call them dragon people without the, without the, uh, without the uh, breath weapon, but uh, their main ability is their ability to uh, have conscious control over their biochemistry. They can change, uh, they can change their, uh, you know, uh, they can make their skin thicker. They can uh, grow thicker nails. They can make themselves resistant to different, uh, to different uh, environments. They can also change their sex. They can change their personality. They can, they can uh, consciously change their personality. So, 
they're yellow. Uh, green are the Thakak. Uh, they are uh, from a planet that was colonized by humans, and they uh, are in the Stone Age there, but they are actually highly adaptable. There are factors on Slice of Heaven that are keeping them in the Stone Age that will be revealed later. They have four legs, four arms. They are, uh, it's called, they are what's called sequential hermaphrodites. They start out as male. They uh, develop into female during their lifetimes. And uh, there is a period between the two where they are basically both male and female. They're green. Uh, blue would be the Volca, and I think it would be the Volca and the Risu, and I think Sazzy would be uh, more qualified to talk about them than me. I'll cover that after you finish. Okay. Uh, let's see here. That's uh, blue, green, yellow, red, uh, purple, and... Uh, I believe that leaves a uh, purple and orange. Those are kind of placeholders now where we're going to put, we have, I have plans to put uh, species in there right now, but those are placeholders for later. Well, you so, mind if I, um, yeah. Take use of the purple for something because I've been having plans for that one real quick. Yeah, sure. No problem. Okay. So I'll cover, uh, the, the, the other three species okay. at the moment here. Is it time? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. So, the Volca and the Risu, when I mentioned real quick in there that um, red represented modern era species from Earth, well, we're talking about um, Cenozoic era uh, beyond that point. Like We're, we're talking um, the beyond the Anthropocene, basically. Uh, those ones. Yeah. Well, there was a very long time ago, I read a very interesting news article about the uh, theory is that what if uh, there were industrialized civilizations that existed? Oh, say perhaps Mesozoic era or earlier, and would we even find any traces? What kind of chemical traces would they leave behind? Mm -hmm. what, what would even be the result of that? And I was thinking, because I at this point I already had had the Volca as a species. And Sean was familiar with him from interacting with one of them in Champions Online in RP. He met one there. Anyway, and I'd already been kind of toying with certain ideas for a while, but I'd never quite finalized it. Um, but I saw that article and it finalized the, the, the thought process. So blue represents the... Um, the uh, two species that uh, left Earth at the end of the Mesozoic era, a uh, theropod species that had um, detect had had developed a rather advanced civilization, but to develop the technology to get off of Earth in time took about two hundred more years. What happened was that they detected um, radio signals coming from that giant meteor that hit Earth, the asteroid hit Earth. Mm -hmm. that, um, theorized to have caused the end of the Mesozoic. There had been all old uh, that had passed from the Sagittarius arm of the galaxy into the Orion arm of the galaxy. During the transit, uh, it had spent about 200 years in, in, a, in some other star system with a civilization that may or may not still exist. Uh, they had uh, studied it, had uh, research installations on the on the site, and when they realized it was leaving the star system, they put warning beacons on it uh, with uh, all of their collected data set up so that uh, those that may run across it or be in the path of it and have the technology to pick up these beacons could uh, hopefully have enough time to translate the warning messages and understand the data on there of what kind of composition this thing is, the mass, things like that. So they would hmm. have some be able, time to be able to prepare for disaster or find a way to deflect or destroy it if, if need be. Yeah. Um, the Velka detected a signal based their entire space program initially around trying to reach this thing so they could get at, at whatever was creating the signal and uh, try to find out what's going on with this thing they found the information and the warnings and the abandoned research facilities ruins mm -hmm. um 
which was a complete wreck. The data archive was buried below the surface because most of the stuff on the surface was destroyed from countless centuries in space by that point. Yeah. Well, they realized, okay, we can't, we don't have the tech to deflect this thing, but we can leave. So we're going to get out of the way. And so they took a look at uh, archives of the um, nuclear engines that uh, were uh, a suggested uh, method of um, pushing this thing out of the way. Yeah. But that, that they learned, that civilization learned, learned that um, that it wouldn't be enough, but it was a suggestion for a possible egress if they really have to, or if it was in the path of a smaller body, yeah. that they could push the smaller body with, with away from it or something. Well, they, they were coming up with all sorts of desperate scenarios to try to help whoever could potentially use any of it. Well, the Volca looked at the, the nuclear rockets and like, we could make large scale craft and use these as a way of getting our civilization somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Well, they um, they decided, okay, we're we're we are expanding massively in our population. Uh, at this point, when we come back to Earth, it's not going to be habitable for us anymore, likely. Yeah. We're going to find somewhere else. So they yeah. created these world ships and left. They took this um, precursor rodent primate species with them as a food stock, along with a bunch of other things. Um, and they left because of the, the Valk are predatory. Mm-hmm. Well, eventually, uh, some researchers in the government for the fleet uh, had the amoral idea of what happens if we upscale these tr- arboreal little uh, snacks, try to make them bigger so we can solve a, a, uh, the impending food crisis? Yeah, basically uplift them. Oh, yeah, but... To a point, basically just upscale them so they would have more food to eat instead. Yeah. Uh, not factoring in the increase in intellect that would result. And then further corruption in the government, um, people decide, okay, now we have a uh, trainable labor force that then when they become useless, we can eat them. Mm. And we're, we're talking like... Eons ago, the Volca were rather amoral. We're talking a predatory species that looked at everything else as food at the time. Yeah, this was back, you know, 65 million years or more. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So they they upscale them. And this leads to that. And the uh, Risu, as they are known now, now known as, were rather unamused at the prospects of facing them and revolted. And the uh, revolt was swift and brutal, and uh, there were some Volca who, turns out it was actually quite a lot of them who disputed the um, intended use of the Risu, and sided with them, and they changed their governmental administration. The Risu are are recognized as part of the uh, Volca matriarchy, which is their government. And anyway, the blue represents the matriarchy, and it's uh, the uh, Zvalka and Risu, who were both from Earth from that period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, and then the purple represents a species that is not native to the Orion arm, but some members of it are part of the Covenant, the uh, Rattel. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you're um, familiar with the name Honey Badger... Uh, one of the other language names, uh, I believe the, the word would be Africans, uh, mm-hmm. which, is, if my memory is correct, is a derivative of German and um, it's like Africa. Dutch, I believe. D- Dutch. It's, cl- it's yeah. close to Dutch almost. Yeah. Um, well, their name for the things are Raytel or Rattel. Um, so it gives you a sense of what these things are. Um Rather large, rather durable, and basically like honey badgers that can stand on their back legs, stare you down while looking down at you from overhead, and um, they're like eight feet tall, I believe. Yeah, yeah. 
their entire society started, they were created artificially as an answer to a, uh, an incident going on in the Sagittarius arm that could be equitably described as a fantasy star incident. Basically, Dark Falls happening there. Yeah. Or whichever well, whichever way his name is is translated this week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, the civilization in that star system were primarily scientists, researchers, researchers, intellectuals. Basically, they um, were also pacifists. Their culture was strictly pacifist and refused to fight if they could avoid it. They would deal with um, raiders by simply kind of um, letting them take what they wanted and then uh, they basically just kind of they they they, they if, if like uh, raiders came to their system and stole stuff they wouldn't pursue they they would just rebuild afterward. Well, then they had the. Uh, the Dark Falls style incident occur, yeah, and uh, they didn't. They didn't have nothing against um, pacifists. I am myself, except for if the, the situation calls for it for survival. Um, they had been that way for so long; they didn't know how to defend themselves sufficiently anymore. Mm -hmm. But they understood genetics rather well, and there were a lot of animal species on their planet that were dangerous. And the the main reason that they survived that long was because of the fact that they had been arboreal initially and had adapted their entire civilization to stay off the ground and stay in the tree levels. And so their entire their, their cities were in, in amid the giant forests. Uh, they had like uh, whole towns that were uh, like a span up between the different uh, branches of giant trees on their planet. Well, they had sent researchers down to collect gene samples from some of the uh, predator species on the ground, and they created an army out of that, and they ended up creating the Rattel. And at the time, they were even more monstrous, but they had uh, the enemy they were facing could alter the genome of things that they were fighting, and so they were, and this distorted it in ways that uh, they found that uh, species with more adaptable genomes. Um, or with a lot of genetic diversity, were able to resist. Like, say, yeah. humans could resist the uh, corruptive effects that this entity had, mm -hmm. but species with less diversity could not. And humans have a relatively adaptive genome. It works against our favor in some in some respects sometimes, but overall, it's a pretty adaptive genome. Yeah. Anyway, the Rattel were created with this basic concept in mind, and they managed to annihilate the um at the time they were bigger they were 10 feet tall and about uh, four feet wide at the shoulders and were more almost quadrupedal when moving and had a hunchbacked uh, posture when standing mm -hmm. well they managed to annihilate the threat but uh had uh, never been taught how to they had been kind of kept isolated from the rest of the civilization around them. They lived the lives of the clone troopers of the Republic, basically. Yeah. They were never taught how to survive a uh, life outside of conflict. Yeah. They didn't know any other way at the time. And it, the, the resultant effect was something similar to the Mongolian hordes swarming over the entirety of what became the Mongolian Empire, basically. Yeah. And they had a Genghis Khan scenario occur, and it eradicated that civilization. But, um... Uh, partially, you know, what happened during that, the pillaging and the other events that I won't yeah. say outright, mm -hmm. um, not to gloss over it or, or wash it away, just... Yeah, uh, we, we know. Yeah. It's better not to bring up certain things. But anyway, <laughs> um... They found out the hard way that, oh, yeah, th this um, results in other versions of us. Wait a minute. This one's better at, at certain tasks than we are. They have hands that can manipulate tools that we can't operate. Um, and then one of these hybrids uh, comes into... It, 
had been ostracized by the Bertel and had been raised among uh, survivors of one of, the, of their uh, pillagings, yeah. had learned their ideals, and came back for revenge to avenge what uh, had become of um, what had been their adoptive family, and came into the council chamber and beat the ass off of the, the, the guy in charge, the Khan, beat the Khan's ass off, took his his throne for her own, and and um, because the Rattel at the time respected uh, power, uh, they were they kind of they they bowed to her, and and mm-hmm. so she ended up bringing societal change over the course of the two hundred years she was around, and uh, the dynasty she caused to occur um, continued that societal change. But amid the societal change, they were also adapting through um, interactions with other species. They were learning new uh, tactics and new uh, cultural aspects, and, which was being absorbed into their own. They, You know how the Zentradi and Macross didn't know anything but war and had no culture of their own, but then were exposed to humanity and absorbed human culture and kind of became an extension of humanity, so to speak? Mm-hmm. They had a similar situation happen to them. They had a huge amount of time for this to play out for. They've been around almost as long as the Volga have. And so they've had a very long time. At this point in time, uh, most of the Sagittarius arm is in some way genetically linked to, to them. Yeah. And most of the inhabitable regions are, at least. Uh, the Rattel no longer are a conquering army, but guardians of these uh, various client states within their region of space. Yeah. Um, the name in their own region of space no longer applies to uh, one species, but the whole, but the whole of the whole area. And so, if you see, say, a human or something there, and they've been living their whole life and they've been raised among them, they're going to consider themselves as part of that as well. The word to them means the unified, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of like. Uh, it, it, can I just make one interjection? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. It's it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like with the Kalair. They're the ones who made the covenant. And Kalair is not is not really the name of their species. The Kalair means being with the soul. It means sapient being. So anyone who is sapient is a Kalair to them. Mm-hmm. We just we just use that as a convenient way to describe that species. But anyway, continue. Anyway, they are typically rather. Um... They, they, they can live for a long period of time, so they can survive the uh, the gap, the, the trip through uh, the gap space between the, the uh, Orion and the Sagittarius arms and the areas where there really are no good stops for supplies. I mean, there's going to be stars and systems and stuff between mm-hmm. the two arms. The arms are just the most densely uh, populated sections, but there aren't... It, They've discovered the hard way that there are, while there are a lot of star systems there, there are not a lot of planets with resources, and there aren't really many people in the gap space mm. where you can get help or refueling from, and so, or even food supplies. So, even for them, they typically will uh, either go into cryo or into kind of a hibernate state until they get to the other side of the gap, back into the Orion arm. Because of the events going on in the Orion arm, things are more stable in the Sagittarius arm, and so the Rattel can afford to come across, but but not everyone can afford to really come over to their side. So the Sagittarius arm is probably going to be very unexplored for the moment as far as everyone else, but the purple represents the Rattel who joined the Covenant who saw. The thing about the Rattel is that their uh, approach to society is very fluid and adaptive as well. And you're going to run into Rattel who are very interested in the ideals of the Covenant, and they're going to join that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. If it if it seems like we, there's a lot of uh of like deep lore or backstory to this game, there is. We're hoping that players won't have it. It will give players ideas, but they won't they won't have to. They can. They'll only have to. Inter, you'll only have to interact with the parts of that backstory that they're interested in. If, you know, something like a deep story like that, 
might be inter might be interesting to like say an archaeologist or a treasure hunter or something like that or you know or a tomb raider but it's but for anyone else they, they can ignore that you know it's it's just it's just kind of in the background and it's something interesting to know you know if you you know if you want to learn it as a hobby but it really doesn't affect your everyday you know life it's that so, does yeah. that does bring that does bring me to one qu to one question that I mm. that is inevitable when you have a setting that ha that has su that has such an expansive lore and I'm saying this is a veteran of stuff like Legend of the Five Rings, mm -hmm. um, Sh Shadowrun, BattleTech, and a bu and a bunch of other games that do put a lot of um, detail in their lore. Um, you can run the ri some games can run the risk of um, continuity lockout. Where the, where there's the feeling that you have to you have to study all of this and have and have to and the players have to be aware of a good amount of this um, lore. As much as I love um, as much as much as I love L five R, it it is something that is that um, yeah. you have to struggle with. And World of Darkness is going because of the faction based setup with a lot of their games. It's going to have this problem in one form or another. It's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. Yeah. Um, how have you how have you guys attempt, attempted or planned to tackle that particular issue? Well, uh, can I, can I can, can I answer this first, Sazzy? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a very uh, we are going to have a very brief uh, description of the of the setting in the front of the book, and we're going to. And in each of the uh, species descriptions, we're also going to have some. We're going to have some lore information in the back of the book. Is going to have you know the history and all that, but uh, it's going to have the history, the steep lore that we just went into, that stuff. But that's going to be in the back of the book, and we're going to put a big, we're going to put a big message there that says you know this might you know this is deep lore. This is you know deep backstory. You don't have to read this for your game. You might want to have this information about the different factions and stuff, but uh, you know you might want to have this you know this basic information about the factions and stuff. But you know the deeper stuff is going to be in the back of the book, in the back of the rule book. We're going to, hopefully, this is going to be just the rule book is it's going to be a single rule book system, you know, just for just to make things simple. But uh, that stuff is going to be shoved into the back of the book where you can read it if you want. But if you just want to start a game, we're just going to have the basic stuff in the front of the book. And, you know, in the back of the book, like I said, there's going to be big messages, going to be big uh, messages there that say, you know, you might be interested in learning this for your character or for your, you know, or for the campaign that you're making. But it's not necessary right now. You just need this information that applies to the present in the game, which is the 29th century. Mm -hmm. yeah, but just... that's also, again, that's a very inter That's a very good question, and that's something we have to. Uh, that's also something we have to work on. <clears throat> but yeah, that it as I said, it's basically the the the, the deeper stuff is. It's all. It's just the background for if you want to use it or if you need it. Um, also, Sean's probably going to be the one who has to cover the um, the summary stuff at the front of the book. I am very bad at summaries. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. Thank you. But yeah, in, in a setup like this, then it gives uh, it gives uh, people something to read if they uh, get bored too. Yeah. Yeah, it's, like... it's something to read on the on, on the toilet, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you were saying. But yeah, it, it's like, like, if you need it, it'll be there in the index. If you don't, yeah. then you don't need it. Yeah, it won't affect, if you don't need it or you don't want to read it, it doesn't affect your game, really. Mm -hmm. It's Exactly. Yeah. It's not like uh, some of, like, um, like, I'm going to put it this way. Uh, and uh, chance of BattleTech are probably gonna shake their heads in disgust here. My first experience with that setting has actually been Mech Warrior Five. Until then, my Mech games were um, the Armored Core series, 
Sega's virtual on mech fighting game series and um, a smattering of uh, localized and um, imported uh, Mobile Suit Gundam games. And that's basically been my mech experience up until yeah. Mech Warrior 5, where they operate more like tanks with legs than uh, mobile suits. But, um, and during the initial uh, couple days, I was hearing a lot of terms and names drops. And there's like a whole... There, in the main menu of the game, there's a thing called the timeline and a, a thing called news. And you, you can click on the timeline and like, it gives you like a, a sense of some of the events going on currently. You can go through the news and go through the various events that are leading up to the current day events and uh, things that are occurring as the game progresses in the background and the factions and everything and stuff as they come up. And I'm just like, wow, this is a lot of information. No. Oh, shit. Mm-hmm. And it was rather intimidating initially, and I still am unfamiliar with basically everyone. <laughs> like, like, there's like a whole s- section of like, apparently um, major pilots in the various factions or like celebrities, I guess. And so like, there'll be whole news articles about something they've accomplished or something. Uh, and it's, it's spoken of like um, Olympic athletes have, who have happened to blow up another or, or person's house or something. And it's describing these events like, like that, like, like you see um, news articles, it'd be the equivalent of someone coming out and saying, Oh, Yesterday, Harrison Ford blew up Tom Cruise's um, car with his giant mech and um, then stole $50 million worth of, uh, of sea bills from his uh, one of his vaults on, on the moon. More news at 11. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, these are people I don't even know. And I'm figuring that these named characters are major characters in the backstory for the series or something. But I have no idea who any of them are. It feels like a bit of soft lock on yeah. that lore lockout thing. Mm-hmm. It feels like a soft lock version of that. The gameplay is great. I'm enjoying the gameplay, but I have no idea who any of these people are right, right now. Yeah. It well, is the, it is literally the incarnation of that meme image of the, the guy with the, 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 the Russian combat helmet with the slit advisor, and, it, and he's holding a simple pistol, and the text says, I do not know who I am. I don't know why I'm here. All I know is I must kill. That's the current feel of the game right now. Yeah. Anyway. What we're trying to do is more like uh, Elder Scrolls. I mean, you don't have to know that Skyrim is on a planet called Nern, which is in a, which is in a its own dimensional bubble called Mundus, which might be a computer simulation or the dream of a mad god. You just have to, you know, you can just walk around, you just wander around and kill people with your with your magic and your sword. Mm. You don't need to know that stuff. But if you want to, it's there. It's yeah, you're right. If you want to know that, and it's very interesting, it's extremely interesting, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Elder Scores Elder Scores lore is something that it you know they do not you know uh, they don't you know, the games don't engage nearly enough with. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, it's it's also something in the background. It's, it doesn't really have to do anything with the game. You can just kind of shove that aside and play the fun game and do the fun things you know we're trying to do something more like that um i will say that if if you think if you think that's wild um lord help you if you ever look if you ever look into the if you ever look into the craziness that happens with lore in the might and magic series (laughs) oh i've heard stories oh boy um the most charitable way I can describe it is drugs. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, the, the Elder Scrolls uh, drugs. There's a reason they don't have Michael Kirkbride working for them anymore. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> well, except for Might and Magic Nine, we don't talk about Might and Magic Nine <laughs> ever. <laughs> you know, every 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 major franchise has as what has I'd say one entry in the in the hall of we don't talk about that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Fantasy Star has Fantasy Star three, for instance. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the music in that. Oh god, my ears still hurt. Decades later. Yeah. 
Like it's, um, in fact, I consider Fantasy Star Four to be a glorified apology tour for three. Yeah, kind mm-hmm. of is. Kind um, of is. Vir- um, Virtua Fighter has Virtua Fighter Third. Mm-hmm. Um, Devil May Cry has Devil May Cry Two. Um, and it's and Final Fantasy has all the bravest. Yeah. Um, could also bring up Mystic Quest, but I feel I feel like that's um a bit of a bit of low hanging fruit. Yeah. But yeah, the point the point is the point is is that there's the, there's always that infamous one. Yeah. Um, Star Trek has Star Trek Five. So yeah, know what you mean. Um. Yeah. I I can. S- I um I remember getting I remember getting into lengthy a lengthy argument with somebody who tried to defend Star Trek Five and I'm like, okay time to okay time to drop the gloves let's see what you got. Because yeah. <laughs> um, I I w- although I will say when it comes to Star Trek films um the the first film deser- deserves a bit more scorn than it gets a lot of people forget about it I cannot hmm. because and I. It's a case of what is a case of asking the question: What's worse, to be annoyed or bored? <laughs> I know. Does anything even happen in that movie? I don't. Except at the very end. Not re, not <laughs> really. It um, let's keep in keep in mind that that was originally supposed around back back around the seventies. Um, because of the fact that they, that Paramount was sick of getting screwed around by CBS, they thought, mm-hmm. "Hey, let's make our own network, and we'll have Star yep. Trek be the flagship." <laughs> yes, I know that. What I know, this was the seventies. Keep that in mind. Mm. Um, but the but but the network thing kind of fell through, and they repackaged what would have been the pilot for a Phase Two mm-hmm. as uh, as the motion picture, or as it's often called, the motionless yeah. picture or the slow motion <laughs> picture. <laughs> I think what's completely emblematic of it is you have some, you have a, a bit of generic Trek music playing er, playing early on, with a with what looks like the Starfield screensaver that I had as a kid. <laughs> For now, now this was cut down in the Blu-ray version, but in the in the VHS version, this went this goes on for five minutes. Yeah, five, and. In the ch- in the chap in the chapter list, it's referred to as the overture. <laughs> <laughs> Which, look, I realize that Star Trek has leaned into space opera over the years, but there's a difference between space opera and actual opera. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since a o- a overture is supposed to set the tone for what's for what's going to be there, and five minutes of nothing. You know what? I take it back. That that perfectly sets the tone. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like I like uh, Star Trek the motion picture, but then I like boring uh, foreign films where no nobody does anything. So you know, what can um, I say? I gotta say that that music's good. The music, yeah, I at least that. Much. I it's the at least at least when it comes to those foreign films where not where nothing go where nothing is going on. There's at least there's an at least an attempt at a point. Like yeah, I'm not I'm not going to roast say Koyan Scotsy for this for this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, largely, largely because even with those, there's um, there's variation in what you're seeing. Yeah. Whereas a, a lot of the really bad scenes in TMP, you just have long stretches of people looking at things. Mm. Mm-hmm. And with those other movies, you go in with the expectation that it's going to be a m- more introspective experience, to phrase it politely. Yeah, you go in with the expectation that it's going to be that way, and you're there for that experience. With the motion picture for Star Trek, you were expecting action, like or at least something unequivalent with the original series. Yeah. You're expecting something like that. You end up with something completely different. <laughs> mm-hmm. Also, worst uniforms of the whole franchise. Yeah. Oh God, they're awful. Um, and they blend into the back of like camouflage patterns for the ship's hull- bulkheads. <laughs> I've seen some people say that they that they were, that those were more inspired by the kind of suits that were used by a, by actual astronauts. I don't I don't buy that for a minute because they look say it. they look like they look like lame versions of um, pilot flight suits. 
Yeah, at least, at least, at least, flight suits with pilots. You're gonna have a bunch of little details on them because every pilot's gonna want to customize their stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and that's that's what that's why the that's why it's not surprising that the gold standard for for Starfleet uniforms would be the ones that would be used in the second film onward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. But getting, uh, be getting I, back. I, I, I was getting, I was gonna say you know uh, we had to get through uh, TMP to get through the off to get to the awesomeness that was Wrath of Khan so yeah, kind of like I'm you okay have to get that. to Fantasy Star three to get to Fantasy Star four yeah um speaking speaking of that uh, speaking of Fantasy Star one particular question that I that I had mm -hmm. and I'm I'm not especially especially since on one hand you guys have, you guys have the Star Trek influence on the other hand you have the fan the fantasy star influence which brings mm -hmm. me to one aspect in f in fantasy star that I'm curious if the if this has been told about <sighs> let's talk about techniques mm -hmm. yeah, you know okay. for um for ah uh, yeah the techniques yeah let's talk um has there and... been talk of putting something sim something similar or was that shot down quick <sighs> Well, um, can I start with that? Yeah, go for that. Okay. But really fast, uh, real quick. The um, yeah. star system that the Vulcan Matriarchy currently inhabits. You know the um, the uh, star or, uh, system Beta Persei? Mm -hmm. Persei? Yeah. Also known in, um, in Arabic language as the Demon Star or Algol. Mm -hmm. Their seat of government is there. And how did the Algol system? Anyway, mm -hmm. proceed, Sean. Well, there are some. Mm, how can I put this? There are some. Uh, there are some uh, metaphysical. I wouldn't call them. Uh, I wouldn't call them mystical, but definitely metaphysical aspects to the game. But they're background things. Earth was, for one thing, Earth was destroyed about nine hundred years before, about eight hundred years before the events of the game. The uh, events that caused it were metaphysical in nature now we have i've now this was just kind of a one-off uh incident and i've never really thought of bringing I, I never really thought of bringing uh spells or things like that into the game however i have thought uh, i have toyed with the idea of making uh an expansion you know it was i was Toying with the name of princes of the universe, where you can do that stuff because, yeah, because uh, the Kalair are the Kalair are uh, immortal. They, they they can be killed by you know injury or hunger or thirst or stuff like that. But they ageless. They, they work, yeah, they're ageless basically. Thank you. And in that time, and they don't deteriorate either, which means they can become fantastically skilled at things but corruptum come from a timeline where magic works uh the the uh takak their planet slice of heaven people on there who go through psychological trauma have a chance a very small chance but chance nonetheless of getting superpowers now these are all these are all crazy things and if we introduce them those things are going to be introduced much later. Right now, they're just in—they're just background things, or they're not even being no, they are not even being—we're uh, not even uh, talking about them right now. But yes, it, it is. Uh, but yeah, we have. But yeah, it's—it's it's something that we have toyed with. Also, the Risu and some of their stuff. Oh yeah, the Risu too. Yeah, the Risu have their own thing going on, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's that later. But yeah. Anyway, uh, continue with that. Oh, I should. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, with Teresa, yeah. um, you know how uh, stellar energy, you know, the solar winds. What happens to that when it hits the edge of, star, of star systems? Is it just dispersed into nothing, or are there perhaps certain gravitational currents that pull that along and pick up that energy and uh, create certain kind of like. Like you know how like uh, the ocean has currents. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine something like that, but on a galactic sta galactic scale, resultant from uh, st solar winds from uh, various stars, 
and you end up with like these uh, galactic ley lines, so to speak, of the supercharged yeah. energy. Mm -hmm. Urisu can tap into that to a degree and pull energy from it. It's it's mm -hmm. limited and only some can do it. And uh, they there are certain risks that are that come from that. Um, that would be perhaps the closest thing to um, photon based uh, techniques as one could possibly get in this setting. Mm -hmm. But um, it takes extensive training and understanding of how to do it. And while most can have the capacity to do it, most do not pursue the training required yeah. to do it. And so it's like they're aware that, they, that it exists and it has an influence on their culture and society, but they do not themselves use it. Yeah. It's the one of the reasons I'm one of the reasons I don't want to introduce mechanics like that into the game is that it makes it makes the game more it makes the game more complicated and already it's already complicated. Uh I think that the system can uh can uh can tolerate, you know, can uh, accommodate uh, expansions like that, like magic stuff like that. But, you know, uh, for right now, it's like, but what we want to do right now is uh, the Star Wars universe. If people didn't know that the Force and Jedi and Sith and Force users exist, you're just, you're just someone who doesn't even know that that's happening. You know, later on, we'll introduce that. But for right now, you're just, you know, to, you are just uh, mundane people who don't know that this, this stuff is happening and really... It doesn't affect you except in, you know, huge, you know, galaxy changing ways that, you know, you can't really, uh, you, you can't, you can't really deal with until you become higher level and, you know, you start to, and until you break out of your everyday life and you start to get and you start to explore and engage with that. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, to answer your question, uh, it's something we thought about, and it's something most people wouldn't uh, engage with in their daily lives, or even in their, you know, you know, even in even in the most extraordinary circumstances. But it's there in the background, and once we get those mechanisms there, they'll be there for players to engage with. Mm -hmm. Like you, like a, the FM might have a, a random Brisu character who's like the Gandalf. Of, of a town and um he, he lives in a tower or something and um puts on pretty light shows like gandalf like the, the kind of stuff you see gandalf doing in the movies kind of thing yeah. but then that's about it and then um but then the players don't get to do that kind of thing things like that you know yeah keep, for now we're keeping things grounded or you know it might even be you know kind of like you know almost a, a parallel world happening you know mm -hmm. or a secret world happening that you know and the two don't interact with each other expect except under very specific circumstances mm -hmm. and then in that concept idea for these princes of the universe um one good thing that could be done with it is to make it so that it can be adapted to existing campaigns yeah because the frameworks are all there it's just that we don't have the um the frameworks for the uh say to use the uh, fantasy stuff terminology the technics we don't have the frameworks for these kind of things yet but the base game frameworks exist and it would be uh, quite honestly a simple matter of patching considering yeah. we could use the same discipline mechanics and the same traits mechanics and uh it could be easily patched in by fms into an existing campaign mm -hmm. Characters right now have abilities. They're right now they're basically like they're they're basically slightly more powerful than uh, tr they're slightly more powerful than three point X, uh, D and D three point X uh, feats. In uh, it, you know in uh, they're slightly more powerful, but for but in exchange for that, you, they're most of them aren't inherent. Most of them aren't on all the time. You actually have to tap them or use them uh they have limited uses mm -hmm. but and if we did if we did something like that they would probably we would probably give we would probably give more powerful characters extra traits that would uh that would apply to those special you know metaphysical instance uh situations and they would have uh, access to a whole lot more uh abilities mm -hmm. 
that. Got, I gotcha. Hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, I know, th I know that this is in a early access kind of phase, but what is the next step that you guys have, pl you guys have planned for its development? Uh, well, next step is to get some playtest data for it actually playtest and see if all these ideas we have are even viable. There's a chance that there is a very good chance that, you know, uh, you know, we're building, we're building uh, sand castles at high tide here. And, you know, it, it's just not going to work. We have to find out if they don't. And, um, and once adapt. we get, yeah, and adapt, basically, we're going, we're going to have to get that play testing information. One of the big uh, failure points that I see is the is the discipline is discipline in here. We might have to go with a disciplineless uh, system where instead of using discipline, you use traits instead. Somehow, you know, it's less math involved or something like that. But we're going to have to see what our would say and uh, see that. After that, we're going to come out with a refined version and uh a refined version i'll probably play test that one more time before uh before we release it we're looking at like a, at least a two three year timeline here possibly more all right i can i can certainly get that um with the and i'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how um covenant, de covenant develops with time mm -hmm. um but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the temple. <laughs> Not a problem. Yes, thank you for thank you for having us. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and you can stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>